All right. Well, hello, everyone. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing or talking to the founder of Reebok, the iconic brand that almost everyone who's listening to, you grew up with that in some way, shape or form. You know about Reebok, the greatest or one of the greatest shoe companies that ever was, one of the greatest uh, businesses in the athletic uh, space, athletic wear space or athletic shoe wear and all of those things. So I'm really excited to talk to you, Joe. This is this is uh, an honor and privilege for me. And I want to dig into your brain, understand how, what it took to build such a business off such, such a, such a giant business. And as I read the book, as I got to understand your story, I mean, it's such a great read for anyone who is listening. Shoemaker by Joe, um, Shoemaker by Joe Foster, this complete story of Reebok. You need to read that book to understand the trials and tribulations of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So Joe, welcome. Thank you, Manny. It's a pleasure. It really is. And thank you for the introduction. You're welcome. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, um, I want to, I want to, like, there's so many questions that are bubbling in my head as I was reading the book, as I was kind of right. preparing for the interview, it's thinking about the different phases of Reebok. And I may not go linearly in a, like a time, uh, in a timeline fashion, because there are different things I want to talk to you about. Because um, there were these early days of Reebok, and then you guys caught fire. Yeah. Uh, to me, the early days of Reebok were until what, eighty two maybe when you caught fire, and That's just about right. Yes, yes. Is that right? Yeah. And let's let's talk about that. The early days. You guys started Reebok in late fifties or early sixties. Is that right? Nineteen fifty eight. Fifty eight. With you and your brother, That's you right. guys started Reebok, and that was like you went. You know, your father wanted you guys to do what he wanted to do, but you guys said, no, we're going to do our own thing. And there you go. You guys started it. Um, the journey, like I, I want the early phases of Reebok, the zero to $1 million or maybe zero to hundred thousand dollars, whatever that earliest phase where you're trying to get penetration in the market. What is that like for, or what was that like for you trying to, figure out the first stage of this journey to make that first penetration, to get that first um, level of money coming in to make you feel like, okay, we've got a business that we can grow. Yeah. Well, as you say, the, uh, I mean, the family goes back to 1895 when my grandfather is he's, he's credited with either uh, inventing or certainly pioneering spike running shoes. Um, and his business was a fantastic business. You probably read it in the book. He did an awful lot. And he, for his day, he became fairly global, admittedly. He, he, did, he did get to America, um, not himself, but his shoes, we should say. His shoes got to America, but really it was uh, the British Commonwealth, or in his day, it would be the British Empire, which spread the news of J.W. Foster. Um, I didn't get to meet him because he died in 1933. I was born in 1935, but I happened to be born on his birthday. Wow. Quite a coincidence. And my grandmother insisted that I take his name. He was Joseph William Foster, so I became Joseph William Foster. So to cut that short a bit, Joe Foster. So Joe Foster came in 1935. 1939, we had World War II. Um, World War II, nothing went on that much. The J.W. Foster business, now being run by my father and uncle, they repaired army boots. We get to uh, the end of the war and education starts again. So I start having an education and uh, by 17, I've done college and I started work in the J.W. Foster business. Only for one year though, because what happened after one year is way, way, way back then, we had national service. That means all the men had to go do two years in the armed forces. So it so happened that Jeff, although he's two years older than me, we went at the same time. So we leave J.D. Fosters and go away for two years. That changed our lives quite a bit because, you know, when you grow up in a family, everything's family orientated. You do everything with family. Mother does your meals, makes you bed, does your washing, does all those things. 
when you're in the army or in, on the Air Force, now we're doing the opposite, and uh, all that changes. You've got to look after yourself and you learn a lot. So we come back after two years, back to the family business. And what we found was a failing business. The business was failing. They, my father and uncle just didn't get on at all. In fact, they were fighting, literally fighting. We had, Jeff and I had to drag them apart on, on more than one occasion. That is not good for a business. So the business had nowhere to go. And Jeff and I, we talked to my father, tried to say, look, this business needs to change. We need to, you need to look at Adidas. You need to look what's going on. And, uh, but no, because father and uncle were at war with each other, nothing happened. Adidas, that's Adolf or Adi Dassler and his brother Puma, well, his, his brother uh, Rudy, they also fought and they couldn't work together. So Rudy left and set up his own factory, which was Puma. That didn't happen at Foster's. They, they just kept fighting. So Jeff and I were really left with very little alternative because, as I said to my father, look, you know, this business is going to be dead. He used to say, when, when your uncle's dead and gone and I'm gone, this is your business. But as I said to him, I'm sorry, there will be no business and you'll still be, and we don't want you to go, but there'll be no business. It'll have gone. So really, we were sort of forced into, what do you do? We were forced into sort of uh, making a decision. We left the family business, and we set up our own company. We called it Mercury Sports Footwear. Mm -hmm. um, and well, then you say, what, you know, what were those first years like? A bit of a struggle. But, you know, we, we were young. Mm -hmm. you know, I was uh, 25, Jeff 27. And uh, well, what can go wrong? You know, you're young. It doesn't matter if things don't work out. You, you've got a life in front of you. So we didn't worry too much about that. It was a matter of let's give it a go. And uh, Jeff was a, a cyclist. He was also a runner. I played badminton. I, I wasn't in the, the, I wasn't a runner at all. But we, we made a lot, of, um, a lot of friends at the local athletic clubs. There were a few around, just three, four athletic clubs. And, you know, we, we made decent athletic shoes. And so people would come along and feel part of our company. Now, I think this is very important to get us off the ground. We were not just making shoes and just selling them to stores. No, we were selling them to athletes. And those athletes were helping us improve shoes, uh, develop them. So it was, we became part of, the scene as it were so and you were that was your marketing strategy in some ways to go yes. connect with the local athletes and to get them to buy your shoes now were there specific kinds of athletes because i know you were big into running but were you like okay let's find any kind of athletic endeavor or let's find any kind of people who are into athletic endeavors and let's build some shoes for them or let's give them our shoes well you you've got to think um <clears throat> Think local. At the time, we were thinking very local. We were not thinking global. <clears throat> Maybe we dreamt a bit of global, but thinking local. In the northwest of, uh, of the United Kingdom, it's hilly, and uh, we've got a lot of moorland, a lot of, I wouldn't say mountains, but certainly uh, like the Lake District. It's very wet as well. So we, we were making shoes for runners doing cross-country, Anything so <clears throat> coming to us, we made shoes which we, they could use on cross country. They, we have fell running, a lot of fells, so it's fell running, orienteering. You may have heard of orienteering. So we made shoes specifically for this. Area. We also made um, rugby boots. Rugby again in the north of England, <clears throat> rugby league was different from rugby union. Rugby union is a different type that was played more in the south. Rugby league. So we had a business. We develop locally, mm -hmm. and we develop direct to, to a lot of uh, athletes. Mm. And uh, because of this, and running's popularity was beginning, beginning to grow. So as, as that happened, people looked to us, people in, in, the, in the trade, they looked to us and thought, why, why don't we sell these Reebok shoes? Um, and at that point, I had a distributor. So we were manufacturing, I had a distributor. That's how we grew to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, but I, when I used to go, I, I, I started uh, traveling, get the car out, 
go to see all these local sports stores. And uh, I'd say, I'm, I'm Reebok. And then the guy who owned the store would say, who's Reebok? And well, I showed him the shoes. This is Reebok. <clears throat> and, uh, and he'd say, well, look, I've got Adidas and I've got Dunlop. Why do I need Reebok? And that to me was a fairly serious question. Why do I need Reebok? He didn't need Reebok. But, you know, we used to go around to athletic meetings and we were selling our shoes out of the back of the car. And, and I, I re realized this, this was my, uh, these, these were my customers. Yeah, mm -hmm. These are the ones that I should be selling to. So it, and it, it so happened that uh, all the clubs in the United Kingdom were all part of uh, the three A's, which is the Amateur Athletic Association. Mm -hmm. They were all part of that. They, they belonged to this uh, association and the, they produced a book and the book was uh, um, had about 400 different clubs in it <clears throat> and this had the name and address of every secretary so Old. that was it <clears throat> they all they all got a letter and said they could have 15 percent discount <clears throat> and if anybody in uh, in the club wanted to become an agent then he could get the 15 percent so this is very interesting. Like in the early stages, you were going for the early adopters, the enthusiasts, right? The, the ones who are going to be the most excited to try new things. But when you try to go to the big stores, they're trying to, uh, you know, put you against the competitor and ask you like, why are you different or why do I want you guys? But you were penetrating the market by just saying, we're only interested, or you tried the stores, but you found out that going after the enthusiasts was a better marketing strategy or a better way to get the sales rather than trying to go after the big stores. Is that is that what was playing in your head at the time? Well, <clears throat> yes. I mean, going through the big stores, if the, if the stores didn't want me, I had to find my customer. And my customer, I was already working with him. I needed to, to work closer. And having the handbook, and being able to get to it, all those clubs was a, a way into the market. And, mm. you know, once uh, I, I got 100 agents off that first letter, and then I sent a second letter out about two months later, and I, I got another 50. So we, you know, we, event, we eventually ended up with about 200 agents. And what happened then, of course, is that the local retailer, the local sports store. They start to hear about it. Yeah, guess to hear about it. So he picks the phone up and he calls me and said, look, mm, you know, you're selling direct. And if you, if you, I, I've made him interested. Now, now he wants me. So, and, and he said, we'll sell your shoes. We'll stock and sell your shoes if you'll stop selling direct. <laughs> well, I, I thought about it for a short while. And my, my answer was no, we're not <laughs> going to stop selling direct. I only give them 15% you would get it at wholesale price. That is 50% off. And you, you will more than likely, you give 15% to the athletes anyway. You know, you probably do that. You probably give them a, a discount. So I said, no, but I will advertise the fact that you stock my shoes. I'll tell everybody, you know, you'll be part of our promotion. Um, and you will have it, as I say, wholesale price. About 90% of the guys who rang me accepted that so but, hang on so you said okay i'm not gonna like i don't want to sell directly into your stores that's what they were asking for and you said no i don't want to sell wholesale prices so then what was the deal they agreed to well they would have wholesale prices but they but i wasn't going to st st stop selling direct oh okay so you're going to continue selling direct yep. and they can get wholesale okay. and, and they can get that as well okay. and uh I think my main reason for this was that this was our, this was our way of advertising, of promoting, and of developing the brand. Because working directly with the uh, with athletes, Users. yeah, we our, our our image, our image was really high, and athletes would come to us. You know, so we, we built a lot of image working directly with uh, with athletes. As I said, we got we certainly got big, and by the time we got big, and there was a, a wholesaler or say a, a distributor wanted to buy all our product and they would do the uh, they would do the selling mm -hmm. which is fine because they had they had the, the representatives they had everything we had opened the door the market was there 
But for us to then set about uh, having salesmen, that, that, that would detract from expansion, really. I mean, mm -hmm. I would have to go into, uh, uh, well, we would have to have a lot of salesmen, which to me, yes, it was one way to go, but uh, easier to go with somebody else. Unfortunately, the people I, uh, I went with through a series of events went out of business. Mm. And they nearly took us with them. <laughs> and wow. That was fairly disastrous for us, but uh, it's it's in the book. And how, how big did the company get, or in revenues before you said, okay, we need to make a foray into America? And you, I, I know you tried multiple times till you got your breakthrough in seventy nine, or but the first time you went to America was probably in sixty eight. Mm. Like, how big was the company in the UK or in Europe? I don't even like before you said, okay, we need America to make this work? Well, in the UK, we're doing okay, but we're a small company. We were probably less than a million pounds in revenue. Okay. So we were quite small, but we knew that uh, the really the way to expand was not to expand our, how should we say, our selection of footwear. In other words, mm -hmm. not to go into football, soccer, as you know, it's soccer, not mm -hmm. to go into soccer, not to go into a lot of the other uh, sports. That that would have been more difficult because soccer mm -hmm. by that time was owned by Adidas. Adidas, Adidas, they were really in there. And for us to get in there would have cost an awful lot of money. Uh, for me, um, I, had, I had met a guy called uh, Frank Ryan. Frank Ryan had been working with Fosters and Fosters had been selling... 200 pairs of their running shoes to Frank Ryan and Bob G and Jack. And that were, they, were, they were head coaches at Yale. And what they were doing, they were buying them at Yale and they'd be selling them around to other universities. So what I knew was that all, all the universities and all the colleges in America had a coach. Mm. And a coach was very important. Mm. He, and you could actually go to those colleges on a sports scholarship. So sport was really big in America in the 50s, 60s, really big. And mm -hmm. I thought the best way to expand the business is to get into America. For me, the disposable income, the 350 million people, you've got so many, and the, uh, the university college system was such that we, we, what about trying to compete well, with, like, in the European market? But that was a big market too. But why, yeah. like, it was, and it was close enough compared to flying across the pond. Okay, but across the pond, three hundred and fifty million. Most of those spoke English. Mm -hmm. Europe, no. You have thirty something countries these days, and you have at least twenty languages. Every country, different language. And a lot of those countries, whilst Germany, France, quite big, a lot of the other countries are quite small. So penetrating 30 different markets. Europe is better now as one. But in those days, Europe was 30 different markets. I wanted one big one. Mm. And the other big one is Japan. Japan was a big mm. market also. But I mean, they're both a long way from Europe, mm. a long way from the UK. But the best thing was, I mean, I was reading a magazine in 1968 and uh, the British government wanted us to export. And they were willing, they were willing to pay for a stand at the NSGA show, the National Sporting Goods Association of America in Chicago. They were willing to pay for a stand and pay for our return offer and pay half of the hotel bill. Well, that didn't take much thinking about it. <laughs> it was like, okay, we'll go. I remember on that first occasion, uh, I went with a friend. Um, for whatever reason, we took a, um, a discount ticket, which, but we had to wait. We had to stay there two weeks. So we, we, did, we went into New York to begin with. And uh, my friend was in the outdoor business. So we looked at the outdoor stores. I looked at the sports stores. And just to get a, a view of uh, pricing, type of shoes that are being sold before moving on to Chicago. Chicago, oh yeah, the guys loved it. Wonderful. Oh, I like your shoes, I like your product. Good, great. Where do we get them? I say in England. And they're saying, is that New England? No, no, not New England. England. 
across the water. Oh, is that near London? Yes, yeah, near London. Oh my so God. I, I, I realized very quickly that uh, they wanted distribution within the USA. I this is 1968, and as you mentioned, I got in there in 1979. That's a long, long haul. But, you know, this is resilience. This is, we've got to keep trying here. We've got to keep trying. And I had at least six failed attempts during that period, working may, maybe for a few months. And, and for one guy, Shu Lang in Philadelphia, I worked with him for four years to try to get into the market. We couldn't. But, you know, late in the 60s, running became a category in, in America. Start, people were starting to go out training. They wanted a pair of training shoes. And, you know, it was simple. All you needed was a pair of shoes, and then you could go, and you could work mm -hmm. towards getting fit, running mm -hmm. shoes. And by 1975, it was really big. And there was a magazine, Runner's World. Runner's World magazine started off in the late 60s, as just a single sheet, A4 sheet. Uh, by 1975, it was a 100 pages, full gloss, photographs, everything. And every footwear company making sports products advertised there. We, we advertised them. We could afford a quarter page, you know. So we, we got in there, we, we got in. And uh, by 1975, Bob Anderson, who uh, published Runner's World, I mean, he was, it, this was the Bible, everybody mm -hmm. was running. And if you think about it, say 350 million uh, in, in, in America, 35 million, 10% were probably now started to run. They were out there running. Mm -hmm. And uh, fine. So he's got a, a lot of people he's talking to. And he decided he could tell them which was the best shoe. Right, fine. And mm -hmm. that was a Nike shoe. Now, this is Okay. <laughs> But Phil Knight, Phil, Phil Knight is importing these from Japan. And the Japanese company goes, I mean, what happens? When, when you say this is number one shoe, out of those 35 million runners, maybe 10% would want to buy that. That's 3.5 mm -hmm. million purse. Yeah. Phil Knight is doing well. Nike is doing great. But to suddenly up it to so many million purse, that took time. It does take time. You can't just suddenly switch these on. By the time... Production was coming through. Oh, well, here we get um, uh, Bob Anderson decides uh, 12 months later, we're going to change this now. Of course. The different shoes are not going to be number yeah. one. And I, I, I'm not too sure whether it was a different Nike shoe, but I think it was probably a new balance at that point. So he changed it. The whole retail business, they, they were up in arms. Yeah. They were just getting Nikes in when all of a sudden, ah, oh, Bob Anderson changes his mind. Well, no, changes the, the game. <sighs> well, it only lasted for two years now. And then yeah. he changed. He changed to uh, star ratings. Instead mm. of being number one, number two, he changed the star rating. And uh, five star would be at the top. And you could get maybe three, four, five star shoes in the category, the major category, which was a training shoe. So maybe, maybe uh, five. And I knew. I knew we could make a five-star shoe. Mm. That was our job. I knew we could do that. We were not just distant shoemakers. No. Like Nike, like New Balance, you know, we knew the trade. We knew the business. And uh, so in 19, by 1978, when we had the opportunity to get uh, the five stars, we, we designed, designed a gold range. We called it the gold range because we had Inca. Inca was a spike track shoe. Mm. Midas was a road racing shoe mm. and Aztec. Aztec was a training shoe. And that is the one we wanted five stars. Mm. So at the 1978 NSGA show, Chicago, along came Kmart. Came out because running was getting so big, they were anxious to. So get at in. this time, when you guys had the five star shoe at the uh, Runner's World, I mean, there's quite a, quite a few interesting things going on here in the background that, you know, the way you were breaking into markets uh, or trying to, like, penetrating the market was trying to find the influencers in those markets, trying to find the people who held the clout, whether it was the coach or in this case, the magazine publisher or someone like that, where if you can speak to them, if you can convince them, 
with the quality of the product and with your conversation, then you had a way in rather than trying to figure out just broad scale marketing or sales efforts to make this work. Um, is that, was there like always the way you were approaching this, uh, this whole game of building, building your shoe brand, which was like, let's go after the influencers or influencer is a new word today, but let's go after the most, um, let's go after the, the most crucial, uh, people who can influence decision in the marketplace today and not so much spending on advertising and sales and marketing directly. Was that a yeah. conscious? Yeah. I mean, we, we were conscious of the fact that to get into the market, you needed some influence in some way you needed to influence. Um, there was Bill Rogers, uh, Frank Shorter, both Bill Rogers and Frank Shorter actually bought Reebok shoes. Mm. But in those days, uh, the market was still small. Influencing, you know, influencing wasn't that big. Now, right now, everything that all the sports store shoes were fashion. Nike, mm -hmm. Adidas, Reebok were fashion, and you know, I, I think Reebok started that with the uh, with the freestyle. But suddenly, everything goes street. Volume is street. Whilst we're performance driven, mm -hmm. volume is street. Mm -hmm. So you have to get to the street. And what what influences the street? You know. You, as, as we know, what influences now, it's, uh, it's rap singers, it's people, you know, now it's the top uh, players at uh, whatever sport. In those days, it was slowly coming. And um, what I needed was how do I, how do I get onto the market? Yes, I, I could have opened um, a distribution warehouse, but then it meant that's, that's an expensive job, opening a warehouse and employing somebody in America to start selling the shoes that I, I needed something I needed. That, that or maybe book. even advertising, like spending money on advertising and build like trying to get sales through their advertising uh, channels, like aggressive, a lot of ad spend, things like that, whether it was magazines or newspapers or something like that. But it sounds like that was secondary compared to going after people and trying to get people's buy-in. Mm. But to, to advertise, advertising in such as Runner's World, that would have been our pr prime market uh, uh, to, to influence. That, that meant that I did have to have stock in the USA. I had mm. to have that footprint there. Mm. Uh, without that, I'm advertising and people, some people would buy. And, I, and I did, we did get orders from America, from runners, athletes who wanted to buy. But, you know, it's a small volume. Mm. <laughs> That's only small. What they need, well, what was needed was a base. I needed to have a distribution and I couldn't afford a distribution. We were a smallish company and we needed to get a distribution. And it, it was only through Runner's World. This finding that hook, what, we did get a five-star shoe and that happened in 1979. I'm, uh, I, I'm at 1979, I'm at the NSJ. We, we've got... Um, uh, came out, they came on, and they wanted 25,000 birds. <laughs> and that would have been six months' work for our small factory. Mm -hmm. And, but you know, we're going for five stars, and we, we were well aware that if we got five stars, we needed help. We needed, and so Barta, Barta, who were the biggest shoe manufacturers in the world, I had a contact there, and they said they would help, so they could make. But then, then came out and said, yeah, but we need a better price. Wow. A better price, man, we've got to go to Asia. We've got to go to South Korea. That's, that's where the product was best made and best prices. So I already made contact. I knew that we, we'd have to look at better pricing. So I had a contact also for South Korea. So I had these in my hands, I knew. But with Kmart, 25,000 pairs. Yeah, okay. I can get help on that. But, you know, came out, they, they look at the square footage and they put so much value on it and each square foot has got to make enough profit for them. And I thought that might be my first and last order of 25,000 pairs. <laughs> but what, you know, I, I am in Chicago and along came Paul Feynman. Mm -hmm. Paul Feynman, and we got on very well. I could talk to Paul. It was great. And <clears throat> he was running Boston Camping, a small wholesaler, of outdoor equipment, tents, fishing rods, and all the other things. And I, I, he ran that with his brother and his brother-in-law. And I, I more or less get the feeling that he wanted, he wanted change. 
he wanted something. They were they'd probably been doing the same revenue for the last five years. And and how big were they at the time? Like a million dollar business? Probably probably a million, maybe even two million at the very best. At the very best. And it'd probably been static at something like that, four or five years. And so it was obvious Paul wanted to do something. And I thought, well, this would be a nice bolt on business. They've already got distribution, they've already got people. Okay. Instead of selling to the uh, to the outdoor business, they'd be selling to the athletic store business. But that'd be good. And I, I went across to America. I well, I'd, I'd been in Chicago, but I went down to uh, to see Paul in, in in Boston. Nice little outfit, great, you know. And Paul came across to the UK, and he has a look, you know, what Reebok was doing. So he wanted to look at uh, athletic events, ten Ks, whatever. And we could take him to plenty of those. But we took him to three, and we knew the winner. We knew who would win the race, and he wore Reebok, of course. And about half of the field had Reebok on. So he could see that Reebok was pretty well uh, liked and pretty well used in the UK. And so it was the last week in June. That's when the Runner's World shoe uh, edition was coming out. Mm. And uh, I said, Paul, Paul, phoned him. And asked him if he'd go down to the local kiosk and see if he could get a pair of, uh, see if he could get the Runners World. Mm. I, about an hour later, he came back. <laughs> and he said, oh, yo, oh, Aztec. Five star. Five stars. Fantastic. <clears throat> but not only that, Inca, our track shoe, and Midas also got five stars. So we had three five star shoes. That was the hook. That was the difference. And Paul said, I'm your man. Mm. And we, yeah. we started them. So at that point, by the way, just to understand the market and just to understand all the different kinds of shoes you were making, you had running shoes, right? Running track. What other shoes were you guys making at the time? Well, if you're, if you're thinking about the American market, we, we wanted to get the running market. The running That's market, all you were going after. Yeah. yeah. And there were a lot of competitors in that market, right? Uh, absolutely. Oh, yes. Was we, Nike... We, and was Adidas also playing that market in America? You know, funnily enough, Adidas was, but Adidas were very slow. Mm. Adidas didn't see the growth uh, of, of that market, just mm. as they didn't see, well, none of the big companies saw the growth of aerobics. But they, Adidas were not moving fast on that. The problem for Adidas is that they had big manufacturing plants. They manufactured a lot in France and quite a lot in Germany. So expensive. they were not, they weren't expensive. They were not generating the profits and it took them a long time before they actually moved to the East where everybody else had gone. Asia, yeah. Yeah. Whereas so, uh, Nike, is, and Nike and Reebok. Yeah. You guys yeah. were going to Asia. To get profit, this done. Yes. And yes. this is fascinating. Like at that point, when you guys were playing the running game and you wanted to dominate the running game, there were competitors Pl plenty of competitors who are trying to dominate the same market yeah. and uh, like 79, 80, 81 rolled around and you were what, right under 10 million at that point, trying to dominate the runner's, runner's market? Well, yes, I think uh, by the time we got, uh, by the time we actually changed it to aerobics, we were well, that, that's the story that's fascinating to me. So let's even before aerobics, right before aerobics came into picture in the running market, you guys were like, maybe like total Reebok was around 9 million or so, right? Yeah, right. Around 9 million. And this is the story that like, I, the more I think about it, the more I feel like such a great lesson in entrepreneurship here. And for those who are discerning, that maybe like that's very interesting, is when you were able to, and this was all sheer, like it just happened in like, when it all came together, um, <laughs> How, yeah, the aerobics market that kind of started for you, um, was it one of your partners? Al not partner, but one of, um, wh what's his name? Alex, he was the one who started that? We, it's uh, Jesus. Um, Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Martinez. Martinez, um, yeah. Yeah. He, uh, yeah, was say Angel, not Jesus. Yeah. Angel. Yeah. Angel Martinez. Angel, he, okay, uh, yeah. He, he was a tech rep mm -hmm. down, down in uh, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, his wife, Frankie, 
Mm -hmm. She was going to aerobic classes and uh, coming back with her friends and they were full of it. And mm -hmm. I said, well, well, what are you doing? And yeah, aerobic, what's aerobics? And she said, well, we're actually exercising to music. Huh. Oh. And I said, can I come in down to your next uh, class <laughs> and have a look at it? And he did. He went down to the next class. And what did he see? The instructor in a pair of sneakers, half the class we're all wearing the same sneakers and the other half, no sneakers, nothing mm -hmm. at all. And it's struck down held and it's all women. Were they wearing a specific brand? Oh, probably at that time, New Balance, because New, New Balance, Balance. Had, had produced um, a training shoe, all white. So it was an uh -huh. all white training shoe. This is fashion, shoe. yeah. Yeah, and yeah, they, they they maybe had picked up a bit on the uh, on the aerobic side, and but but not thought about it. Uh -huh. And Arnold thought about it because they were all women. So he's, he said, well, instead of making a, a generic shoe, why don't we make a woman's shoe? Oh, Just man. Or women. So it's on a, 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 a tight elastic because the, the woman's foot is not as broad as the man's foot. So it was going to be a woman's last and women's sizes. So they would only go up to probably uh, nine, maybe 10 American. Uh, and that would be it. One team uh -huh. both going. So it, it, now that was a positive decision not to go for men, yeah. not to make this generic. Positive decision for women. So Arthur, on seeing what he saw, he went up to Paul Feynman. He took the red eye from California up uh -huh. to Boston. And he goes to see Paul. Paul, look, this fantastic thing happening down here in Los Angeles. These these women, it was great. And, you know, this exercise is going to grow. I'm sure it's going to grow. And Paul said, whoa, slow down. Slow down. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We're a running company. <laughs> and we're doing very nicely. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And so Arnold was a bit sort of, uh, well, what do we do? Anyway, Arnold went round to the back door. Because it was mm -hmm. still quite small. And he went to see Steve Ligger. Steve Ligger, he, he's the production man. Mm -hmm. Okay. He persuaded Steve Lee to get him 200 pairs of shoe made from uh, glove leather. Glove leather. Yeah. Soft, because Arnold's vision was it's just like putting a glove on. These shoes would be so soft and comfortable and a, a nice cushion. It would have Reebok inside and that little color of the Union Jack. The Union Jack would be there as well. So this was a just a plain shoe, but the Reebok name on it. And he got his tune. He went back. He gave them to the instructors and a few of the leading girls, the girls who were around about town. And all of a sudden, he took off. Oh, One man. problem. Big problem. Big problem. He'd made it. He'd had it made out of glove leather. Now, glove leather, just like Not a piece durable. of paper. No, you can tear it. Just like a piece of paper, it just tears. Oh, uh, okay. So what do we do? Well, I hadn't heard about any of this until we were having problems. <laughs> We were having problems. So, look, we've got to strengthen this up. So what did they do? They lined it with nylon. Lining it with nylon was okay. Wouldn't break out quite so quickly. But then it stopped breathing because yeah. leather breathes and you need leather to breathe. So what do we do? Well, we punch holes in the front to allow it to breathe. <laughs> so marketing is taking over from production. Production is, is following to try and get this right. Okay. So we punch holes in the front. Now, those holes punched in the front now have become a design feature. But mm. what, we had, what we had to do, because these shoes were still falling apart after about four weeks, five weeks. Fortunately, we're in California. We're in LA. The girls didn't care. They loved them so much. They went out and bought another pair. Fantastic. Mm. We, got it, we got it right by so, so that we're moving from glove leather to garment leather. Garment mm -hmm. leather is just that bit thicker. Uh, you know, there's more. But glove leather is about 0.7 of a, uh, of a millimeter. If you can imagine, it's 0.7 mm -hmm. of a millimeter. Wow. So it's not even a millimeter thick. And then mm -hmm. you've got to take the surface off it to allow the adhesive mm -hmm. to get into it. So you were ending up with half a millimeter of leather, and that's no good. So we had to get the, the tanners, they actually came up with it. So once you got the shoe right, what yeah. was the growth like? Well, once we got the shoe right, 
and, and the growth was there, even whilst the shoe wasn't quite wasn't good. The growth was there. And people like Jam Fonda. I mean, Jam Fonda actually went out and bought a pair of Reebok to use in her videos. In oh her my videos. god! So this was it. And the girls just didn't wear these shoes for aerobics. They, they, it was out, they were so comfortable that they just wore them all the time. They went to work in them. They put their heels in the bag and they took them to work and changed change from the shoes. And so it, all of a sudden we hit the street and this was aimed directly at women and we became a woman's company. Uh -huh. That was it. Reebok was a small athletics running company, uh -huh. but you know, only runners knew that. Uh -huh. Now we're gone street. Nobody knew us as anything else. Now we became the aerobics company, a woman's right. company. And we were, we were on 9 million at this point. Mm -hmm. The year after, we were on 30 million. Mm -hmm. Then 90 million. Mm. Then 300 million. Huh. Then 900 million. So wow. It was about four or five years. We were nearly 1 billion. From, this is from nine. This is like the, this is such an amazing ride, especially this part of the story where I'm like, you know, you, it's like persistence paying off over a period of time. And the, the interesting thing here is that you were trying to go after this big market of running and you had all these competitors who are competing with you, like Nike and all of the other big names were there and you were trying to become the king in a category that was already pretty broad and mm. nobody, like maybe Nike owned the category, maybe you owned the category, but it wasn't, it was, it was broad and you were trying to compete in a very difficult market in a red ocean. Right. And then you guys went after women's aerobics. You actually shrunk the market by saying it's not for men. So we're taking out half the market right there. We're going for women and not only random women, we're going for athletic, like the aerobics market. And we're going to make the shoe just for the aerobics market. And by doing that, you guys blew up exponentially, like literally 100x growth over a period of five years from 9 million to 900 million or a billion dollars right. by going after a smaller market, a very segmented niche market. And that's what made the, made the brand blow up uh, so right. amazingly. And it's, it's like, as I'm looking, as I was reading the story and as I was thinking about it, I was like, man, this is unbelievable. The power of niching down, the power of like, doing you know rather than trying to become another player in the big sea of things you, yeah. you decide i'm just gonna take out carve out a little sea or a little piece of the sea and gonna play in that and not worry about this bloody ocean here i don't know if you read the book uh blue ocean strategy by Rene maborn and w chan kim these guys are professors at uh, at uh, one of their top business schools in 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 the in europe and right. they talk about this idea of what you guys just pulled off, which was um, along the same lines as what Southwest was able to do, Cirque du Soleil was able to do, but now mm -hmm. like Reebok did, which was right. not going after bigger, but carving out, like reducing the value proposition or reducing the variables, not giving everything. And that is how you created a blue ocean and blew up the space and ah, love it. Lo it's it's unbelievable what that like how how powerful that niching down is for anyone who's listening like you guys got to read the book and also understand the, this fundamental lesson in entrepreneurship right uh, we can go broad thinking that that's the way to win the market but in the niches are the riches <laughs> well it, it was a fantastic time i mean you, you need you need that touch of luck to be able to see the opportunity when it comes. Yeah. And we were small enough to be able to see that. Mm. You know, the big guys, Nike and Adidas, they didn't see it. And, or, and then, then they, they didn't that. see it and they didn't think of it as enough for them to even wet their beacon, right? They That's said, right. ah, not worth it. Yeah. yeah, not worth it, not worth going there. But of course it propelled Reebok up to that point where Reebok could get into the bigger game. Reebok yeah. could go into basketball. Reebok could yeah. go into American football. You know, you know, Reebok could be a major player in that. And we did. By 1988, I think it was, we, we'd overtaken Adidas. We've overtaken Nike. Mm. And we became the number one player, the number one sports mm. brand globally. You know, mm. that, was, that was big. Mm. 
That was yeah. amazing. So the yeah. question, like, and, and I was just th- looking back, like you guys then suddenly went into all those different verticals and you, you became the lead in those verticals. Um, but then um, lately Reebok, uh, like Nike has overtaken Reebok, right? And Nike has become the biggest brand well, in the space, right? Yes. Nike came back very quickly. Um, Nike had a, probably a better base. But then again, I think the problem with uh, with Reebok is that uh, <clears throat> you know I decided. And by that time, you had already left Reebok, or you weren't really actively involved at the same level. No, I uh, I left Reebok at the end of 1989 mm-hmm. because <clears throat> you know I got Paul Feynman, and Paul Feynman made that wonderful. It happened in America, but that's what I had wanted. And I, I knew if we could hit America, the rest of the world would be relatively easy. And I, I, I set about putting the rest of the world, getting all the distribution. So I put about another 30 different countries on, all around globally. So I was traveling a lot. And uh, we, we were also, I was also hosting a, a pro celebrity uh, event in Monte Carlo. So we had uh, a lot of the people from <clears throat> A-listers from Hollywood coming over, um, John Forsyth, Linda Evans, uh, Frank Sinatra came over, Sean Connery, Roger Moore, with all these guys being entertained, playing tennis uh, against some of the top pro tennis players. So I hosted that. And, and that was incredible. Meeting all those people was fantastic. But at the end of 1989, I'm traveling. Um, I go, whatever I get off, I picked up by a limousine. I go to the best hotels and we eat at the best uh, restaurants. But, you know, it's... Uh, I had time with corporate, so corporate that the, for me, the challenge, the challenge wasn't there anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, this is a different man's job. Different people can run that sort of corporate device. Yeah. Um, the biggest problem happened, and I retired. I just, that's it. The phone never stopped ringing, mind you, but I, I, I retired. And uh, I, I think the biggest problem then was that uh, Paul, Paul couldn't find the right person to take it to the next level. Mm. Yeah. When, when, when you're out up front and you've got to start uh, building your business because the aerobics, the aerobics had driven Reebok rather than Reebok saying that, how do we market these others? How do we go out and sell? No, it was a matter of keeping up with the demand and keeping up with the demand. That was there for five, six, maybe even seven years. And then, then it starts to plateau. And at that point, you need to have different things. You know, you, you, you pick up on, say, Shaquille O'Neal, um, who was the other... They, they, they had a number of uh, athletes mm. that would sponsor. Uh, but then, then you also need you also need somebody to take on the role of being the CEO. You know, Paul had done a great job, but he couldn't find somebody to take that next. And that's the, that's the interesting thing that... I always think about when I'm looking at the stories as they're evolving or as they have evolved in the past, like there is the entrepreneurial spirit, the entrepreneur who can drive things to a certain level and continue to take chances, continue to evolve and iterate as the market progresses, as the market changes. But as soon as you start bringing in management, quote unquote management, as you say, the bureaucracy and the red tape and all of that stuff. Yeah, there is a level of sustaining the business but that entrepreneurial energy goes away. So yeah, you can potentially leverage what was built by the entrepreneur, but at some point when the entrepreneurial energy ceases to exist or you don't really have that kind of entrepreneur who's willing to take the risk, which most of the times is the original person who started the damn thing, right? Right. The new people don't understand or have that level. It's just impossible for someone from outside to be the entrepreneur to to lead a business when some other entrepreneur actually started the business and grew the business. So I often think about that, like what would have been the case if you were at the helm or if you had like, like a lot of great businesses, it's, it's one story when the entrepreneur is there, it's another story when the entrepreneur is left and not at the helm in the sense you had to be the CEO, but for as long as you were part of the organization on the board and like giving direction compared yeah. to when you were gone. Yeah, but it, 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 I, I think this was the biggest problem that, uh, I was, like Adidas, you, you looked at Adidas and Adidas really 
went down and uh, they became a public company when, when the family sold it. And it went through a very, very slow period. But, you know, they had a lot of background, a lot of depth. You know, the company had come from a long way, a lot of products. And uh, eventually they, they got Herbert Heiner and he seemed, he seemed to be able to turn it around. He seemed to be able to move it and start it moving again. So that worked. Unfortunately for Reebok, uh, they didn't seem to find that person who could uh, drive it further. So it, it plateaued and eventually, eventually uh, firemen or, and one or two others, they came to the agreement with, uh, with Adidas. Adidas. Yeah, yeah, to sell it. Adidas, the idea that, well, the idea that was promoted at the time was Adidas and Reebok together would be a challenge for Nike. Did but not happen. Course, didn't happen, no. No. A lot of people who are listening probably don't even know that Adidas or Reebok was sold to Adidas and Adidas was owned Reebok because the branding is all different. The stores are different. So still the world thinks Adidas and Reebok is two different brands. Yeah. But of course, they're part of the same umbrella organization. Yeah, that is, um, that's like, the fascinating part of entrepreneurship that as an entrepreneur, the courage and the gusto you bring, a manager usually can't do the same thing. A manager doesn't have that courage to be able to take chances at the level that an entrepreneur will. Yeah, well, and also they probably come from a corporate world. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they're listening to shareholders. Shareholders mm -hmm. are making certain demands. And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and that can, you know, I don't think Paul was used to that. Paul was more of an entrepreneur like yeah. myself. And uh, what we needed was somebody who a better corporate background, somebody who could step back and get the other guys to go, get mm -hmm. make, you know, make space for other people to do the job and just yeah. be able to watch it. I think Paul, Paul had been used to being up front there, you know, raising the flag and cheering people on and yeah. keeping going. And you have to step back from that, I think, when you get to a certain size. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's all right having your name there. Um, you know, uh, we look now, Phil Knight, of course, has sort of done the same. He's retired, banked out of it. And I, I don't have the name of the guy now who's running it, but mm -hmm. maybe I've not been that closely uh, watching things. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's like Steve Jobs, unfortunately, you know, he, he died. But mm -hmm. Apple has continued to develop and grow. So they've mm -hmm. had some sort of um, resilience there. They've been able to keep the company expanding and going. So they've, they've had a good vision. And uh, I don't, ABG, who bought it now, they seem to be, I mean, they're more of a licensing background. So mm -hmm. they're, they're more licensing. Um, but uh, they're, they're expecting to uh, grow the sales. With uh, CrossFit, I think there is something there, right? Licensing with CrossFit. Yes. Is that part of the game? That they're yeah. trying to, yeah. But that's like, yeah, it, it's just as an entrepreneur, it's interesting to see how businesses evolve and change and grow and on the journey of an entrepreneur versus the journey of the business itself and how managers have a different role compared to the entrepreneur himself or herself trying to do this work. Um, well, Joe, this has been a lot of fun. I know we're coming at the end here. I just talking to you has been very inspiring learning about what you guys did and how you grow the business from zero to a billion dollars over this period of time. Fascinating stuff. Everyone listening, you need to get a copy of the book Shoemaker by Joe Foster. Read it. You'll love it. You'll learn so much about entrepreneurship. And some of the lessons are deep. Uh, some of the lessons you will have to kind of think about and uh, find the answers in there. But Joe, yeah, thank you very much. And would love to have you give the last words. Well, Manny, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, yes, I mean, the ride has been exceedingly good. You know, I've enjoyed it. And uh, I sat back, I stepped back and sat back for a while. Then I wrote the book Shoemaker. And I wrote it because <clears throat> Wikipedia, Google, they were saying, this is how Reebok started. This is what, and uh, there was also on Wikipedia, a photograph of uh, Joseph Foster, Joe Foster, who uh, the founder of Reebok. And I don't know who he is. I've not a clue. <laughs> and, and the stories were so wrong. Oh, and, my God. And so I thought, ah, why not write it down? 
And mm. a lot of people were sort of pushing, well, you write your story. So I wrote it and uh, I, I, you know, I, I come from a shoemaking background. So I, I, I had to ask a few people like, you know, is this right? So, you know, I got a little bit of help in, in terms of bringing it, you know, coloring it in, making it right. But the story, yeah. I wrote the story. Now what's happened is that, like yourself, you've read the book, you find it interesting. I wrote it just to put things right. But mm -hmm. they're telling me now there's a lot of entrepreneurial lessons in that book. Yeah. And, uh, yeah we're, we're, we're going around all, lots of places to universities. In fact, I think in May we're, we're due to come over to the States. And, wow. uh, yeah, and we're, we're going to have something like, a, I think, 12, 12 cities we're going to be in just doing the same thing, talking about the book. So um, California is going to be on our list. So Awesome. Well, yeah. I want to know when you're coming to California so I could meet you in person because I'm in San Diego. And if you're coming yeah. to Southern California, that would be amazing. Well, we'll certainly, uh, I mean, yeah, you know, anybody that we've been talking to now, you're on our list. You're our friends. So we just keep in contact. Um, Absolutely. We'll let you know what's going on because I just have that one ambition left now, one drive, one thing to do. And that's to get Shoemaker to be a bestseller. Yeah. Over in the States. We oh, yeah. We'll, we'll be happy. And you yeah, will make it. Story. And by the way, for everyone who's watching or listening, you guys don't realize, Joe, you're what, 86 now? 86, yes. Oh, my God, man. <laughs> you're so sharp. You're so on point. You remember the details. You know what's going on. Uh, you, like, you amazing. Like, I, I'm so, so impressed. So just like, I'm in awe that you, like, at the age of 86, I see you as so vibrant and so, so alert and so sharp. It's, it's, it's inspiring to me. So thank you. But I, I, I do forget on occasions. And fortunately, I have Julie. Julie's <laughs> kind of younger than me. And she's my prompt. Yeah, she's my external hard drive. <laughs> she keeps me going. <laughs> yeah, Julie has been amazing. She's been helping us get this scheduled and on track. So thank you, Julie. Um, and thank you, Joe. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you and appreciate the work you've done. And a lot of lessons for all of us to learn here. Thank you, Manny. Absolutely been a pleasure for me. And as I say, when we're over, we'll let you know. Thank you. See you. Thank all you. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.